It's a, a distinct honor to, to uh, introduce our two speakers today. We're going to have uh, a little different format. We're going to have a conversation between Greg Bays and Jay Timmons. Uh, I've known Greg, he reminded me since he, he did have dark hair uh, and served on gubernatorial staffs. He uh, ran for uh, treasurer, many of you know, for the state of Illinois. He's the president and CEO of the Illinois Manufacturers Association. It's a statewide advocacy organization representing more than 4,000 companies. He assumed that uh, post in 1991. He uh, became the co-founder of Illinois Coalition for Jobs in 2004, Jobs, Growth, and Prosperity, a 501c4 dedicated to educating Illinois taxpayers about the benefits of a pro-job pro-employer statewide economic agenda. He's been, uh, in 2008, he and Ron Gidwitz formed the Economic Freedom Alliance, a 527 political organization. He worked, uh, as I mentioned, he worked in a number of capacities for Governor Jim Thompson, including uh, as Secretary of the Illinois Department of Transportation, and he headed up uh, the gubernatorial reelection campaign in 1986. Uh, he's also served as the Illinois campaign manager for President Reagan and Bush, uh, as well as being the uh, candidate for, for state treasurer. <laughs> Graduated from uh, Illinois College, and he uh, serves currently on the board of the National Association of Manufacturers. He has brought here today uh, the president and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers, Jay Timmons. Jay, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers represents small and large manu manufacturers and he became the president in January of 2011. They are the le leading advocate for nearly 12 million men and women who make things in America, educating the public and policymakers on issues in this incredibly critical uh, segment. Prior to his appointment with the uh, NAM, he was the executive vice president of the National Association. He also has served uh, in government as a staff assistant to Governor and uh, Senator George Allen. Uh, he was the chief of staff there, 1991 to 2002. And he's also served as executive director of the National Republican Senatorial Committee during the 2004 uh, election cycle. Um, we're very honored to have both Greg and Jay here today to help us. I learned, I learned on Sunday uh, we're celebrating Manufacturing Month in uh, the United States. So they will have a conversation about uh, the economy and about manufacturing. I'm going to talk from here at the moment, just so, until I get sort of wired back up. One thank you uh, to the City Club for uh, having us, uh, and Jay and I uh, asked if we could uh, come and speak to this group, and as I told Jay, this is always a forum that um, uh, is, a, uh, I guess I'll use the term, insiders, because you folks do know what's going on. You're folks who understand the public policy issues of the day and influencers uh, in, in many ways in your own community. And so it's an important group, Jay, to, to talk with. It's also a group that um, don't try to BS, so I don't want him to give the, although I've got three or four board members here and he's always kind enough to say that I'm one of the best trade association presidents ever. I said, don't, don't say that to this group. Because <laughs> they, they'll, they'll see right through I always through say that. you're the best. Oh, the best, that's right, <laughs> that's right. And so, and so uh, anyway, Jay is uh, an outstanding leader of um, the manufacturers in this country. You see him quite often on uh, CNBC, the other business networks. Uh, last week, uh, you saw him in the Oval Office with President Trump and a group of manufacturers. So he is very wired into what's going on in Washington and, uh, and leading voice uh, and has just become an outstanding um, advocate for manufacturing in this country. So we thought today that we would uh, uh, do a sort of a round table or back and forth discussion to allow him and then 
allow you to uh, have some questions for Jay as well. And I think the, the important issue on the mind of a lot of people, which Jay can speak to you right off the bat, is tax reform and what are its chances uh, passing uh, uh, this year and what are the impediments and where it stands and also to this kind of group, sort of what procedurally is going to occur. And as we look through the budget issues that are facing uh, the federal government and, and what can we expect in the next 60 days or so in Washington. So Jay, I'll let you lead off with that issue. I'm always happy to have this discussion, but when you invited me, you said you were inviting me to a baseball game tonight. <laughs> well, are you a Nationals fan? Well, should I say so in this room? I don't think so. Let's just leave that one behind. I'm from Ohio, so I was, I'm more of a Reds fan. So, uh, Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you all for, uh, for being here for this discussion. And it is a really important one today um, because we have an opportunity, really, for the first time in three decades. And if you think back where you were 30 years, of, 30 years ago, I know many of you probably weren't even on Earth 30 years ago. Uh, but 30 years ago was the last time we had comprehensive tax reform, specifically comprehensive business tax reform in the United States. And <clears throat> we would like to think that when we do something of that significance, we, we get it right and we don't have to think about it again. But guess what happened along the way? Along the way, other countries started to figure out that they wanted what we had. They wanted the investments that we were uh, driving in this country. They wanted the jobs that we were, we were creating in this country. They wanted the quality of life that our families had the opportunity to achieve in this country. And so what did they do? They started to reduce the cost of doing business in their countries. And they started, very smartly, in many cases, with a reduction in tax rates for businesses. And all you have to do is look a few miles to the north and look at what Canada's done. They're at 15% uh, corporate tax rate. You look to Ireland where a lot of companies have had to make the very painful decision uh, to invest. American companies have made the painful decision to invest in Ireland because they have a 12.5% tax rate. So for manufacturers, this is really all about competitiveness. And, and um, one of the things that I think is, is so incredibly heartening is what manufacturers see as, as possibilities and opportunities when it comes to comprehensive tax reform in this country. Uh, we conduct at the NAM, we conduct a, uh, a survey every quarter of our members to find out kind of what they're thinking about the economy, how they're feeling about their own business and the path forward. And for the last three quarters, we've had record high optimism from manufacturers. It's hovering about 90%. Think about that. Just a year ago, it was 59%. What changed? Well, we know what changed politically. But from a policy standpoint, what we're seeing is, is we're seeing manufacturers say, this is, this is the time for us to actually achieve some of those changes in our federal policy that we've been waiting for. So we, we surveyed these manufacturers. By the way, this, this uh, survey is done with Industry Week magazine. And what we found is about two thirds of manufacturers say that if comprehensive tax reform is achieved this year, they will use that rebate from the federal government to, to invest in more plants and equipment here in the United States. About three-fifths of them say that they will use that, that rebate to hire more American workers into their manufacturing facilities. And a vast majority of them say that they will use that money to provide higher pay and benefits for manufacturing workers that are currently part of our manufacturing workforce. So, so for manufacturers, tax reform is an imperative. It's an imperative to, to incentivize investment and job creation here in the United States. And for manufacturing workers, 15 of whom stood behind from plant floors all across the country, stood behind the President of the United States last Friday when he signed, this is what Greg was referring to, when he signed that Manufacturing Day proclamation. For them, it's about a better quality of life here in the United States. So we're excited about the prospects. We know that we have many, many hills uh, to climb to achieve this goal, but we have a short time to do it in. But we are very optimistic that it can get done this year. Jay, what <clears throat> does, um, the NAM has talked about for the last several years, the, um, where manufacturers start in the worldwide economy behind 
uh, behind in what they have to pay, what they just to get their product competitive. Can you speak yeah. to that that issue so that people understand why and how that works into the tax reform yeah, issue as well? What we're up against. So here in the United States, it is about uh, somewhere between 12 and 24 percent, depending on what sector of manufacturing you're in. About 12 to 24 percent more expensive to do business here in this country than anywhere else in the world. That is, by the way, without even factoring in the cost of labor. Because we don't really care about that. We're, we like the fact that we pay very, very well in manufacturing. But some of these other impediments and these other cost barriers um, make it pretty difficult. And, and again, force those tough decisions for companies. Uh, it actually incentivizes companies to do business outside of the United States, which makes absolutely no sense. So adding to that cost of doing business here are really three major drivers. The first is taxes, which we've already talked about. We have a 35% corporate tax rate. That's no surprise. It does still surprise some people to know that that is the highest corporate tax rate in the industrialized world. So of all of our competitors, we have the highest tax rate on manufacturers. Now, the effective tax rate, what, what tax rate folks actually pay is oftentimes different. But what I hear from most of my members is from C-Corps, they're still paying somewhere between 31 and 34% effective tax rate. So two for the business, one for the government. And by the way, that's only the federal side. Add in the state and local side, and you can see that you're quickly getting up to about a one-to-one -one ratio. For S-Corporations, that rate can go up to 44%. So the NAM led the charge for a 15% corporate rate, corporate rate and, a, and a similarly competitive S-corp rate. And uh, we were really pleased when the White House came out with their initial proposal. What ended up on the table is 20% corporate, 25% S-corp. It's not nearly as competitive as we would like to see, but there's still some room for the negotiators in Congress to bring that, that number down. So 20% or lower for the C's and 25% or lower for the S's is, is what we're pushing. The other cost driver are regulations. And we can get into a, we can get into a, discuss, we can get into a two hour discussion on specific regulations. But suffice it to say that the regulatory burden on manufacturers is pretty significant. And by the way, this is not a political issue. A lot of folks wanna say, well, it was the Obama years that, that really drove the regulatory burden. Well, it didn't help. I'll be the first to, to admit that. But this has been going on for decades. Republican presidents, Democratic presidents. Republican Congresses, Democratic Congresses. And the result, as of December 31st, 2016, is 200, and by the way, this is an actual number, 297,696 regulations that specifically impact manufacturers in America. And I would like to be able to report to the regulators that every one of my 14,000 members, large and small, can recite chapter and verse what each, one of those, what each one of those regulations mean to them, but obviously they can't do that. They try their best to follow the law and follow the regulatory morass that we have in this country. But here's what it, here's what it really means, those 297,696 regulations. It means $35,000 per employee per year in compliance costs for small manufacturers. One of my board members, Sandy Westland-Dinahan, is here. And we've talked about this a lot because what she wants to do is she wants to hire more people, she wants to create more products, she wants to export to other markets. And unfortunately, she and other small businesses around this country are faced with that daunting compliance cost number. Now, I, we just had a conversation with the Chicago Sun-Times and of course the immediate response is, well, you want to get rid of all regulations? Absolutely not. Who in the right mind would say we don't need regulations in a free market economy? You've got to have regulations because you need to promote clean air and water and healthy, uh, healthy and safe workplaces. But there's got to be a balance. And $35,000 per employee per year seems to be a little bit unbalanced, especially when that money could go into more investments into your facility, and hiring more workers and raising base rate of pay. 
The third issue then is infrastructure, which we can get to in a little bit, but that's another cost driver, the, the, the cost of a failing and crumbling infrastructure system in this country is, is a competitive disadvantage as well. Off script just for a second though, and, and mentioning uh, Sandy over here and also at the same table is Mike Castle, who is with Boeing Company. And these are two companies that are, uh, that uh, the example of the issue, one of our favorite issues to talk about, <coughs> Export Import yep. Bank and in being able to get it reauthorized, and people want to say it, you know, that it's, quote, the bank of Boeing, sorry, to, but that terminology that is used. But to a Sandy, Dina Han, who, who uh, exports uh, floats that, uh, that to, I think Southeast Asia was the one you were talking the last time, that was being held up because of the inability of this small company, employs, what's your employment level, uh, Sandy? So it's not the Boeings of the world being helped by uh, the uh, export-import bank that many of even our Republican friends have um, been in opposition to. But it's another one of those regulations that when you do not allow for businesses to have that opportunity, large or small, you're really tying one arm behind their back and being able to compete in the worldwide economy. Um, let, me, let me jump in on that okay. just a second. because. The, the export-import issue is one that is actually quite ripe at the moment, and it's one that is, is quite concerning. Companies like Boeing can't compete if they don't have certain guarantees that are provided by the Export-Import Bank. They're not even allowed to compete for, for contracts outside of the United States in certain, in certain companies or countries. Um, and it's not, again, it's not just Boeing. Think of the thousands, the tens of thousands of suppliers to Boeing that rely on Boeing being able to sell and export their product. Uh, think about the, the 3,000, pardon me, the 30,000 small and medium-sized businesses that are direct beneficiaries of the Export-Import Bank. So what Greg was alluding to is, has become a, a very weird partisan battle in, in Washington, and one that, that frankly needs to be rectified fairly soon. So President Obama wanted to reauthorize the bank uh, the Republicans in Congress decided that that was somehow a, you know, that was a, a, a Democratic homage. So they started to, to, uh, to reject it. And finally this year, President Trump said, well, I like the bank. And so four out of the five governors on that, that he's nominated to the bank are, are great and should be, should be approved. There's one guy in particular that's a real problem. And I'd like you to remember this name because I'd like you to speak out uh, very strongly if you hear it. His name is Scott Garrett. He's a former congressman, actually the only Republican to lose incumbent, to lose his election for Congress last year, which was quite a feat. Um, <clears throat> and Mr. Garrett uh, has spent his entire congressional career trying to destroy the bank, not reform the bank, mind you, because every government institution can handle reform of some sort or another, but to destroy the bank and put it out of business. This wouldn't be such a problem if a majority of the five governors made the decisions of the bank. But unfortunately, the chairman has the sole authority for determining what deals the bank will, will take up. So we're working very hard to defeat Mr. Garrett, and I'd urge you to do the same if you think American jobs are important because there are a lot of American jobs that are dependent on a fully functioning export-import bank. Real quick answer to this question, your guess percentage of success for tax reform this year? Look, I'm an optimist from Ohio. You know. <laughs> we always have a positive outlook. But, but I really, I, I believe in my heart that members of Congress understand the tax reform is an absolute imperative right now. We can't continue to compete. If, you, if you're saying we shouldn't have comprehensive tax reform, if this is a yes or no answer, and you say no, then you're defending the current system that is, that is incentivizing jobs to being, to being taken out of our country. You're defending a system that is keeping the manufacturing worker down in this country. It is an indefensible system. We've got to make this change, and now is about the only time to do it. Now is the only time to do it. Um, 
there's going to be, again, there's going to be challenges to get this done. You're very, very aware of that, Greg. Um, and sometimes we, we forget that we have to have conversations on, on a very positive way with those folks who should be on our side on this issue. But ultimately, I think both Republicans and Democrats believe that this is something that should get done. Ultimately, it may be a partisan-only vote because that, sadly, is the way that Washington is working right now. Um, but my hope is that there'll be some bipartisan support for this as well. Two more quick issues, if we can. Um, Tom Cross, uh, chairman of the Board of Higher Education here in Illinois, has some his students here from Aurora University uh, with us today. Thanks, Tom, for uh, doing that. Welcome, uh, young folks, uh, being here today. And, and let me just say one thing about that. When we're talking about creating more jobs in this country, when we're talking about tax reform and regulatory reform, creating new jobs in the United States, those are your jobs. Those are the jobs that you're going to compete for. Those are the jobs that we want to hire you for. But we can't get there unless our federal policy is, is aligned correctly. Well, describe uh, on a whole the, 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 the size and the scope of this issue. Just in Illinois, 600,000 manufacturing workers. We estimate 30 to 35,000 retiring a year. Uh, the baby boomer generation as it moves through the pipeline. Uh, the vacancies, and you can speak to the numbers nationwide that we have in manufacturing facilities because we can't fill those jobs. And what's the NAM and a national policy that we should be uh, looking toward and changes there? Yeah, so we have a great partnership with IMA and, and, other, and other state manufacturing associations on this very issue. Our Manufacturing Institute, which is our foundation at the NAM, uh, focuses almost solely on, on the workforce issue and what is that issue. It's a worldwide issue, by the way. Um, but it's certainly one that is, is prevalent here in the United States. We have 350,000 manufacturing jobs in this country that can't be filled. 350,000. And by the way, that was true even in, the, in the, the height of the Great Recession. We could not find people with the skills to fill those jobs. And that's kind of a two-prong issue. Uh, one is that, the manu that, that work in manufacturing is changing. I'm so proud of my, my grandfather who stood in line for six months during the Great Depression to get a job in, in manufacturing at the Mead Paper Mill in Chillicothe, Ohio. And, you know, he was finally just picked from, from the plant manager there because they were tired of seeing him every day, <laughs> you know. So they said, come on, get started. And he was there for 40 years. And my grandfather's work didn't really change all that much. Greg has seen in my office I have this big six foot by four foot um, uh, photo, it's on aluminum, of my grandfather's paper press. Still working today, 80 years later, my grandfather's been retired since 1971, he passed away shortly after. But how that press operates is completely different today than it was when he and his colleagues were, were hand, you know, using their hands to, to make this thing operate. Today it's all technology driven. And that's, a, that's actually a bad example because modern manufacturing today is nothing like my grandfather's day. Modern manufacturing is all about technology. We hear about robotics and you hear the, uh, uh, the naysayers talk about robotics taking away manufacturing jobs. Not true. It's just changing what manufacturing is all about as you all well know. Somebody's got a Somebody's got to design, somebody's got to create and build and operate and maintain those robotics, as well as artificial intelligence and, and other new technologies. The types of jobs in manufacturing are what's changing. And uh, this, this problem that we have, the 350,000 today, is projected to grow by the year 2025 to about two million unfilled jobs in manufacturing. That does not make us competitive as a nation. We need to fill those jobs. And the way to do that is to, to make sure that young people understand what opportunities are available in manufacturing. But I would also say that it's not just young people, it's their parents. Because there's frankly no, no worse, um, um, there, there's no, there's some, there, those who advocate the least for manufacturing jobs are the parents of young people coming up. And I'm actually a pretty good example of that. I was telling Greg earlier this morning, my grandfather wanted to leave the farm and he left the farm and he came into manufacturing. 
And he said, you know, I don't want manufacturing for my son. So my father, he got him excited about this brand new emerging industry, retail, right? So that was, that was the new thing back in the 50s and the 60s. And then my dad said, oh, we want something better for you. We want you to be a lawyer. Well, God forbid that that would happen, you know? So <laughs> thankfully that did not happen. Um, worse, I got into politics. But today it's full circle. Folks are starting to realize that manufacturing jobs are really the cool jobs of the future. And a lot of parents are starting to realize, wow, a lot of these jobs don't take a four-year degree and $200,000 in college debt. They realize that a lot of these jobs are available right out of high school or perhaps with a couple years of technical training. Some certainly require four-year degrees or advanced degrees. But oftentimes, the jobs that we need to fill are those jobs that just require a, a couple years of, of technical training. We're working with a lot of community colleges. I had the opportunity with you during our state of manufacturing tour in 2016 to visit Harper College and, and Palatine mm -hmm. High School where we've got some great technical training programs and I, I actually talk about, I talk about those wherever I go in the country because I think those are best in class examples of what can happen in a community when the communities and, and and manufacturers work together to create a curriculum that will help inspire and train young people for careers in manufacturing. And one last issue before we open it to questions, uh, Jay, John, thank you for being here today. Uh, um, trade and the importance of uh, it to Illinois. And I've learned a new statistic today. I always talk about the fact that Canada is our largest trading partner in Illinois. Uh, but uh, John told me the statistic of um, the fact that uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Missouri, the amount of trade that uh, with those uh, three states is larger than the state or the total of what the United States does with China. And so, it, what's that? The Canada does. That, that Canada does, excuse me. And so you think about the importance of that issue to the Midwestern economy. So not only to that, your Ohio roots, but generally the trade issue and how that is playing out in Washington. Mm -hmm. and, and, well, it's bumpy. Yeah. <laughs> to stop there. Uh, but look, we have a president who wants to get the best deal possible for the United States worker. And I don't think there's anybody that's going to disagree with that. We want what's best for the United States. We also are very cognizant of the fact that we've had, in, we've had agreements in place that have actually worked for manufacturers in the United States, and they've been good for trade. That said, and good for the American worker, and certainly good for the American worker and the American economy. That said, the NAFTA agreement is a quarter of a century old. There are not too many agreements that can't use some fine tuning. Um, so the president's made the decision to renegotiate NAFTA, and we're focused on NAFTA, by the way, because the Trans-Pacific Partnership is kind of out the door. That's not happening. The the Atlantic Agreement is kind of on the back burner, <clears throat> and the administration seems to have a preference for bilateral, meaning country to country negotiations, instead of multilateral, which means the United States with several countries uh, involved. So given that, and given the fact that he's opened up NAFTA again for, for renegotiation, uh, there are a few things that, that the NAM thinks that we need to, to focus on. Um, enforcement mechanisms are, are going to be key, and, and they need to be neutral, and they need to also not hinder um, our, our commercial relationship. They need, to, they need to expedite it. But I think most importantly, um, and this is, a, this is an issue that we certainly have with Mexico, um, we need to make sure that there's not third country cheating. So having a country like China, for instance, uh, subsidizing major products that are brought into the NAFTA zone and then undercutting our our own products here. That's a tough one, and that's one that has, I think, exacerbated some of the sentiment uh, throughout our uh, manufacturing workforce that there's, a, there's an imbalance in the agreement. And it was one that was not contemplated 25 years ago. So it makes sense to look at issues like that, but ultimately, we're very hopeful that we will, we will get to a point where everyone is in agreement, where the United States understands the importance of issues that are already in the agreement, like the, the ISDS provision for uh, investment disputes. That seems to be one that 
is in question right now from the American side. It is one that we feel very strongly about. Um, and, and we believe that it helps, it helps in reinforce and enforce the rule of law. And there's nothing more important when it comes to contracts or trade agreements. Frank? Thank you. Now we'll get some, to um, some questions. If you have them, fill them out on the, the uh, blue sheet. We have one over here. Uh, Amanda, one of our staff members, uh, can get to them. We'll give a uh, special privilege to our chairman, Ed Mazur, uh, who asked for a comment on the lawsuit by Whirlpool against LG and Samsung. Uh, is it more than just about washing machines? <laughs> Yeah, so my comment's no comment. <laughs> we, literally, we, we, it, it would not be wise to engage in uh, disputes between our members. <laughs> so let's just leave it there. Association Politics 101. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Nisa Sweet uh, from Braided River Group. Where Nisa's, okay. A City Club member. Tax reform proposals seem to help companies but hurt individual rates. Can you do one without the other, without hurting the other? Yeah, I don't actually, I don't think that that is the, uh, uh, I, I don't think that's actually correct. Um, and I'm very aware that there was a Brookings Institution uh, study that came out 24 hours after the framework was set. Um, in fact, I had a microphone thrust in my face uh, the within five minutes of that of that uh, report being issued, and it was highly critical of of the uh, legislative proposal, and made the point that this was going to hurt individuals at the same time it benefited companies. And my response then was the same as my response now. Um, they're simply hyperventilating, and the reason they're hyperventilating is because there is no legislative proposal. Nothing's been written. And that's what's so amazing about how this town, or this town, Washington, uh, works, and, it's, and the media and how they work. It's almost as if there is a reluctance to assume positive intent. I happen to think that tax reform is good for everyone, not only because you're gonna reduce rates for business and make them more competitive, but because the overall goal and everything I have heard from the, from the negotiators who put the plan out was the goal is to reduce the overall tax burden for the middle and lower income uh, taxpayers. Upper income may not fare so well, but they are not exactly a sympathetic class, and, and that, you know, that probably factored into the, to the negotiations. But the bottom line is no proposal has been set. The Senate, the House, House Ways and Means, the Senate Finance Committee, they're all starting to just talk about you know, what, do they, what are the goals legislatively that they want to achieve? Our goals for the business sector, 15% corporate tax rate, similarly competitive um, rate for S corporations, meaning individual taxpayers who have businesses, a territorial system so taxpayer, or so that companies are not paying taxes twice or being encouraged to leave their, park their money offshore uh, incentives for uh, investment and incentives for research and development. And that is pretty much the framework that was, that was offered by the negotiators, except the rates were higher than, than we, we had proposed or we had encouraged. But to this point, there's no legislative language. So there's really nothing to, to quote unquote score at this juncture. Okay, Peter Landau, um, can you comment on the progress of man the Manufacturing Technology Center being built in Chicago? and the impact you think it will have. Greg, this is probably more for you. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we're gonna go to AMHUB this afternoon <clears throat> over at, um, and talk with some of the folks over there. I think that um, uh, this is all part of the reinvention of what uh, is occurring in this city and in the state of, uh, and in manufacturing across the country to look at marrying technology and its opportunities uh, and for the kind of bright young people that are getting into manufacturing, I mean, it is just astonishing when you go to uh, some of these trade shows and see what is occurring and what the opportunities uh, are going to uh, be changing the face of manufacturing facilities in the years to come. 
So while I can't comment directly on what is occurring there, it is one of the positive developments and we'll, uh, uh, I think we have to look for the opportunities to increase employment numbers. We have been decreasing in the numbers of manufacturing employees for a long, way too long in this state and uh, we shouldn't be. Our neighbors aren't doing it and we should be changing that trajectory as well. Okay. I will say this about technology and manufacturing, you call it a marriage, it's almost a shotgun marriage. I mean, you've got to, in order to succeed today, manufacturers have to infuse technology, they have to infuse robotics, and, and that is the way they become competitive. We, we were in Germany together, Greg and I, uh, was it last year? Mm -hmm. it's, it seems a lot longer. And you saw um, um, Industry 4.0 is what they call it. We call it the Internet of Things. But the bottom line is that technology is infused in literally everything. I mean, from my, from my cell phone, I can control my, uh, many of you can as well, I can control my HVAC at my home in Virginia. I can turn fans on and off. I can turn my lights on and off. You know, those, all of those technological advances are now infused in every part of a product that many manufacturers produce. And uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. We at the NAM supported the creation of, of these institutes um, because we did feel that we needed more attention focused on, on, uh, on modern manufacturing. And I think this, I'm really excited about going this afternoon. We have an uh, interesting question from the Aurora University table, Robert Efren. Robert, right there. How does the future of manufacturing look in Illinois considering the state's budget and fiscal concerns? <laughs> Uh, maybe I could go the whole lunch and not have <laughs> and, and you ask the question. Um, it's pretty awesome. You question. know, I, it, I uh, was here a year ago. Some of you uh, might have been here, heard me uh, uh, lament about the, the current situation we face in the state. Um, it has not gotten better. In fact, it could be argued that it has gotten worse. There seems to be uh, an inability on our leaders in Springfield to understand, to use the words of the old uh, song, you don't know what you've got till it's gone, the uh, Joni Mitchell song, that until... Do you know who Joni Mitchell yeah, is? Yeah, probably. <laughs> she does. She does. She does. She does. I thought that as I was saying it. There's no way you don't know that. Um, that, you know, 600,000 jobs, that statistic I keep using uh, just 13 or 17 years ago at the turn of the century, which, you know, sounds like a long time ago, not that long ago, we were 900,000, 300,000 jobs lost in this state. Um, if you use the old multiplier effect of two jobs for every manufacturing jobs, uh, then you're easily talking a half a million, three quarters of a million jobs that either have been lost or never created. And what was the impact on those families, those uh, opportunities for those families? And I think uh, we see uh, the, one of the lines I use that Illinois is closing one day at a time and you only have to take a trip not too far from this location or across downstate Illinois and see the impacts. And so it takes all of us to continue to push our leaders to say, you know, you've got to start talking about what are the root causes here and the spinoff of those causes uh, in, in crime and uh, the inability to uh, make neighborhoods better. And then the, the fact that we're losing jobs and when you look at the statistics, our neighboring states, they're growing manufacturing jobs. So it shows it can be done and that we should be working on that. But uh, my lament, my shout, my scream at the top of the mountaintop is, is that our leaders still aren't paying attention to the issue. Okay, we have uh, three questions. I'll try to combine them here from Charles Orlowek, Robert Hess, and uh, Sandy Westland Denabar, all about um, labor, changing the perception of manufacturing with parents. Is there a cultural difference with manufacturing jobs uh, with the severe shortages? Comment on that? Uh, I think you're just talking about the perception of manufacturing overall. And, um, and as I said before, I, I, really, I really think the biggest impediment to a lot of young people getting into the manufacturing workforce or looking at manufacturing as, as, a, as a career choice are, are parents. Um, so part of our job at the NAM and part of the job of the Manufacturing Institute is changing that perception. Um, it is Manufacturing Month in Illinois. I'm, I'm really impressed you make it a whole month. 
Uh, we got the president Get to right. to uh, uh, to name last Friday as Manufacturing Day in America. We had 3,000 events across the country on Friday where manufacturers opened their doors to what we estimate about 600,000 students, their parents, community leaders, and teachers to give them firsthand exposure to modern manufacturing and what modern manufacturing really is. I mean, that's kind of step one, right? I mean, you, one day a year. Great, you celebrate, you move on. So our job, and I think the job of all manufacturers and, and uh, uh, those who, who really do care about making sure that we kind of recruit that next generation, the manufacturing workforce, is to continue that, that discussion, that dialogue, um, that exposure to what modern manufacturing is. Now, we're doing that in lots of states, including here. Uh, the Illinois Manufacturers focuses on a program uh, that comes out of the Manufacturing Institute to expose uh, high school students to manufacturing throughout the year and to give them, to give them uh, uh, kind of a real world look. And then we're also working with community colleges to align curriculum to the needs of manufacturers. We're also working, by the way, with, uh, with branches of the military to recruit returning military personnel into the manufacturing workforce. This is a, multi, <laughs> this is a multifaceted uh, project to recruit people into the manufacturing workforce. And the irony is, the irony is that the average wage for a manufacturing worker here in Illinois is $84,000. That's the average. We'll go much higher. The average age for all other sectors is 55000 so think about how far ahead you start just from, this, just from the beginning. And getting that message out has been, has been a real challenge, but it's not all just about money. Although I bet right now that's what you guys are really thinking about. It's also about, it's also about satisfaction and, and having a real purpose for the work that you're doing. And manufacturing provides that every step of the way. But the education side and being able to not only at the early age and getting it, but you know, with Tom here and, uh, and the higher education component. I was at College of DuPage uh, in uh, John Carpenter's neck of the woods last week. Uh, we were, it's middle of the afternoon walking through College of DuPage manufacturing um, uh, where they do their uh, classes. And of course they're empty and there's nobody there at 2.30 in the afternoon. By 5.30 it was gonna be full from 5.30 to 8.30 because it's the people who are coming back for retraining, the folks who already had a four-year baccalaureate of some sort and, and want to move to something else. That's what's occurring out there. Yep. And we've got to provide more opportunities to be able that while people are still working to be retrained. And also in that facility at the College of DuPage and every, uh, as you walk down the hall and the bulletin boards, um, a job wanted uh, of vacancies uh, for people on the, uh, the posters that were on the board, bulletin boards there. So it's, it's an enormous challenge that we face and uh, I urge our leaders like Tom and, uh, and those of you who can help influence that in your community of what are we doing to get the opportunities for people to be retrained. Okay. Um, Jack Lavin, City Club member, can you talk a little bit about the need for an infrastructure bill? I think you, you touched on that. But. Go right ahead. Yeah. So, um, we were very encouraged when both candidates for president last year were talking about a major significant investment in our nation's infrastructure. And we're not talking about just roads and bridges and ports and inland waterways. We're also talking about broadband. We're talking about the electrical grid. Um, personal experience yesterday lost power for the fifth time this year because my lines are all above ground and we had a tree fall. So I mean, it, it, it's an epidemic across the country uh, for, for our infrastructure. And if you go to almost any other one of our competitors, economic competitors, their infrastructure is far better than, than what we have here because they're making the investments necessary. When then candidate Donald Trump talked about a trillion dollar investment in, uh, in infrastructure, we, we jumped on that. And you'll see on our website at nam.org, there's, uh, there's a plan that we call Building to Win. And we we not only outlined the need, which is about $2 trillion, by the way, um, but we also talk about how you're gonna pay for it, because that's the obvious next question. And I actually think I surprise members of Congress when I say, well, actually, we have a list right here. 
And their next question is, well, are you gonna, are you gonna support any of these? And my response is, we will support any of them that you put on the table. And it's, it's not a necessarily popular position. I can tell you that many of my members don't necessarily feel quite as strongly <laughs> as, as the organization does about getting this done. But ultimately, they think that we do have to get this done. People talk about a gas tax increase. Okay, fine. I'm not going to reject that. But if our national policy is more miles per gallon, then how is a gas tax sustainable? It's not. The numbers will never add up. It's why we have a shortfall right now in the Transportation Trust Fund. So we've got to think of new, new ways that we're going to raise revenue. If we truly believe that we are going to have a user-based system, meaning we're going to take money in specifically for infrastructure outlays, uh, then we're going to have to have new, new ways of, of raising revenue. The cost to manufacturers is significant. The time delays for getting our product to market, our product to port. Um, the, the lost time for our workforce in traffic congestion and bad infrastructure, roads, bridges, tunnels, um, that matters to quality of life for all of our all of our people in this country and manufacturing, manufacturing families care deeply about it as well. So this is something we're very focused on. I will say that the administration uh, took our plan, Building to Win, not the administration, the campaign uh, took our plan. They put it on their website. They really pushed it out, which we appreciated. When the president took office, uh, they used that as a basis for their discussions and actually <coughs> promoted it quite a bit. Their final plan is really still being developed. Where it's headed, I'm not thrilled about because some of the folks internally are coming up with their own plan, which I don't think is what the president wants. The president wants to figure out a way to spend a trillion dollars from the federal government on infrastructure, program, on, on infrastructure throughout the entire United States over a 10 year period. What some folks, um, within the administration have come up with is about $200 billion over 10 years, leveraging $1 for every four that a state is willing to put in. And what they're saying is the state should raise taxes to pay for that. It's kind of a non-starter, right, right from the beginning. I get the philosophy. I understand what they're trying to say. But if you're thinking about an intermodal system that is nationwide, this is a national priority. This is not a patchwork of state and local projects. That's what's gotten us into many of the messes that we're in right now. We're quickly running out of time. Just a couple more. Uh, Mary O'Connor from the Sikich Corporation, or Sikich Partnership. With respect to tax reform, do you support tax simplification? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's a simple answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. I thought it might be. But then, of course, we have, we, this is the city club, so we need our, our sandbag question to end the program. Uh, please explain your involvement in the Illinois political process. From, this is from Laura Murphy, the Illinois State Senate. Uh, the impact you have on elections, positive, negative, and what can we expect in 2018 and 2020? I'm going to let Greg end with this, <laughs> except to say, you can either thank me or blame me um, for the presidency of Barack Obama because as you noted, or as was noted earlier, I ran the Republican Senatorial Committee in the 2004 cycle. And you might recall that that was the year that Barack Obama succeeded in becoming a United States Senator. So I was not successful in, in Illinois and uh, my record I think ended up uh, ended up uh, paving the way for Barack Obama to become are, president. Are, are you telling us that you recruited Alan Keyes? Uh, <laughs> no, but if you ask me after this, I can tell you who did. <laughs> and it wasn't me. Um, I'm, I'll end it with a sandbag answer to the question. If I could have just run a better campaign in 1990 and beaten Pat Quinn, think about where the world might have gone. <laughs> I'd like to ask everybody to, to join me in thanking uh, Jay Timmons, Greg Bay. <laughs>